Sonic R was developed by Traveler's Tales and Sonic Team and released to the Sega Saturn in 1997. At the time, Sega was battling with Sony and Nintendo in an all-out console war. Sony was releasing hit after hit after hit, seeing success with original characters like Parappa the Rapper, Crash Bandicoot, and Abe, the farting chant guy. <laughs> Nintendo and Sega? They weren't strangers to mascots. Nintendo, of course, had Mario, who is used to create fresh 3D titles like the groundbreaking Super Mario 64 and iconic Mario Kart 64. And Sega? Well, they had Professor Azubin, the bow tie wearing rabbit. Hello. Wait, who? He has a monocle. Hello. Okay, but more importantly, they had Sonic the Hedgehog, everyone's favorite platforming speedster. So how exactly did Sega utilize their ultra-famous animal hero on the Saturn? They released two titles, Sonic 3D Blast, a game available on the Sega Genesis, and Sonic Jam, a collection of four games previously available on the Sega Genesis. <sighs> Two games showcasing adventures already available on a legacy console? That's really disappointing. Mario was running fully rendered 3D circles around a Sonic, tiptoeing carefully from the past. For many, no new Sonic game meant no new Saturn purchase. Worldwide, fans saw little reason to pick up the console. What else can go wrong? Surgeon Synapse Online 2, it's the Sphincter. What is going on up there? By 1997, it was failing badly, except in Japan, where apparently it outsold the Nintendo 64. So they've got that notch on their belt. Sega had to do something to bolster the sales of their floundering system. So in November of 97, they did it. They released Sonic R, a brand new polygonal Sonic racer for Saturn. Would it live up to the quality of everyone's favorite quick quilled speedster? Or would the game be an omen of disappointment that fans would come to expect for years to come? Let's pretend we don't know. Cram a chili dog down your face and do your best to keep pace as we play Sonic R. The game begins with a quick splash page and then it's right on to the main menu. No fancy intro videos here. They clearly want us to get racing as fast as possible. Gotta go fast. Let's see Sonic bolt out from the starting line. Ready, set, go. This is bad. Even for 1997, this is bad. Why does trying to stay on the track feel like pushing a greased oyster on a warped slip and slide? If the footage doesn't properly convey the situation, let us explain. The most glaring problem with Sonic R is its controls. They fight against you at every opportunity. The issue is that turning is weak. Your character's turn is so shallow that you'll constantly be running into obstacles or off the track. The basic D-pad turn is almost completely useless. Useless. So you'll try and use Sonic R's drift option for hard turns, which also doesn't work well. What the manual calls a drift just harshly leans your character into a turn in either direction, depending on what button combination you push. You don't get the tight control that a real drift would give you. Awkwardly tipping around turns is all you have, so you better learn to really lean into it. Drifting or power sliding is a big help in similar games. A great example is Super Mario Kart for Super Nintendo. Enter a tight corner and hold either shoulder shoulder button as you turn and you'll be power sliding to victory. One shoulder button did it all with this much older game. But you know something the Super Nintendo didn't have? An analog gamepad. Perfect for precise movements. Perfect for a racing game. And guess what Sonic R supported? The Saturn 3D control pad. It had an analog thumbstick and triggers. Surely this fixes all of Sonic R's control problems, right? Yeah, about that? Shame Sonic R was not actually programmed to use analog input. What? Wait, what? The manual states that the game supports it, but the 3D controller's thumbstick is totally underutilized. It acts just like a D-pad, and those special triggers, they work the same as basic shoulder buttons. You get direct on and off inputs. The manual lies? Professor Azabin, is this true? Yeah, it's a dick move. Over on the old 64, analog controls made Mario Kart super fun. It gave players a sense of control many had never felt before. But Sonic has something that Mario of this era could not touch. Two words. 
Spin Dash. This trademark lightning quick move would fit perfectly in a racer and leave the competition choking on their dust. I bet it's awesome. Not so much. Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles can all use this move called Spin Dash Roll to get a small boost. But once you're rolling, turning is practically restricted. You just can't do it. Sonic's iconic spin ability dashed before our eyes. Really, controls feel like an afterthought here. If you stumble and run into a corner, which you will, guaranteed, there's no reverse button to get out. The only way to get back into the action is to slowly rotate your character until they're facing the right way. Uh, then you can hobble back to the race. Come on, what do you mean there's no reverse? The Saturn controller has six buttons. Six? Isn't at least one of them reverse? Well, let's see. You have your accelerate, which is B, X and Z change your view, and A, C, and Y all make your racer jump or do a special attack. Three buttons all make you jump? Why? And what's worse, no options to modify the controls. It's likely that Sonic Team was attempting a strange hybrid racing platformer. We think standard racing controls and physics were avoided to make room for platforming designs and moves, like jumping. But this isn't the only problem here. We want to break down the level design, but it's going to be a little hard to show as the in-game camera feels so floaty and confused. It clips constantly through objects, characters, walls, Pretty much everything. The camera regularly fails to keep up with the racers while going through loop-de-loops. And when going up an incline, it points straight ahead instead of aiming upwards. So you can't see where you're running. Again, the gameplay in Sonic R offers a weird combination of genres, platforming and racing. The camera system is obviously confused by this blend, not knowing whether to stick close to the racers or properly show the world around the player. The execution of these mixed elements just isn't working. It's like a daycare and a petting zoo. Separately, they're fine, but together, now the goats have a taste for blood. Our biggest problem with these maps is that we're constantly left confused as to how these races are actually supposed to work. I mean, there's a vague indication of the route the game wants you to follow, but to get all the tasty collectibles, you have to completely ignore that. Heck, you don't even need to cross the finish line for a lap to count. Just jog on by flipping the bird. It registers. It's freaking madness. Yep, the path laid out is an illusion, a mere suggestion of a route. Once you started the race, you can go anywhere you want as long as you eventually vaguely loop around. Don't think that's fair? That the designers never intended the course to be abused this way? Well, someone better tell the freaking AI racers. Look at this. They're avoiding the loop-de-loop -loop and not even passing through the finish line. They know. What is going on? Some obstacles don't even function properly. Your characters just defy gravity and fly past hurdles like walls. You can just walk vertically straight up a wall like Spider-Man. Hey. Spider-Man. There's a point on the reactive factory level that the game believes you're going in the wrong direction. You're not. The game is just confused. What is going These maps are some of the worst designs we've ever seen in a racing game. It's not just that the levels are confusing and broken. It's that there's really not much going on here. There's just five levels total. That's the entire game. The levels are as bland and lifeless as boiled celery. Very little of anything is moving outside of the racers, and there's almost nothing for them to interact with. That is, if you can actually see what's coming up ahead of you. Yeah, the draw distance in this game, folks, it's short. The first time you play, you won't turn in time. You'll fly up the mountain, guaranteed. This failure in design greets every new player like a warm, welcoming kick to the tails. Every main map features plenty of water obstacles sprinkled everywhere and anywhere. Even slightly dipping a quill in the water sinks you. There is no gradual descent from the shoreline. You're either on land or in water instantly. It looks ridiculous in action. Oh, but don't worry. Sonic and friends will not drown. They'll just endlessly bubble under the blue, like an Elka-Seltzer tablet. <laughs>
what exactly does the platforming play like? Well, you collect rings. It is a Sonic game after all, but these rings have nothing to do with health like previous games. In Sonic R, they help you get around the level. There are locked doors that will open up if you've collected a specific number of rings. These lead to hidden parts of the map. Rings also power accelerators. Your boost is dependent on how many rings you have. The more rings, the further you go. So no rings, no boosting. This mechanic is completely unbalanced. It means that the racer out front, the one that needs help the least, has all the advantage. They get to snap up rings before you can because they get to them first. And when they hit an accelerator with all those extra rings, they get a greater boost than you get. But there's help to collect rings, sort of. There's a power-up called the Thunder Shield, something fans of Sonic 3 would fondly remember. It draws rings towards you with its super awesome magnetic ability. Best ability ever. How could they screw that up in Sonic R? Well, your character is going fast. So fast that you don't actually collect the rings. They just kind of trail behind you. A ring might reach you every so often, but the rest constantly whip around all over. So you might have the bright idea to tail a character in their cloud of rings waiting for the shield to deactivate. Then you can collect all the rings after they're freed. Well, after the shield ends, uncollected rings phase out of existence. Oh, you heard me. For more help gathering rings, you can get ring bonuses from panels scattered throughout the levels, but they're randomized and don't always give you what you want. You'll be working hard for your precious metal hula hoops because if you don't pick them up, you won't be able to find Chaos Emeralds. They're scattered around the four main maps. You've got to collect them all to unlock one of the secret characters. Emeralds are hidden away behind those big doors that are unlocked by rings. So that's why no rings means no emeralds. Saving up enough rings can get tricky if you're not careful. If you accidentally pass over an accelerator, it can wipe out all of your rings and have you start collecting all over again. When this happens, it is rage inducing. The irritation doesn't stop with the rings either. Get this, you lose your emerald if you don't come in first place in the race. They even have a dirty little failure screen just to cram it down your throat. Oh, and just to rub salt in the wound, a couple of the chaos emeralds aren't hidden just behind doors to quickly be collected. Sometimes they're stuck in an object like a pyramid, and they don't open until the door itself has been opened. You'll have to wait for the emerald to reveal itself. It's not instant. It takes time. So you might just need to unlock the door on one lap and then go back to the area again on a second pass to get the gem in an attempt to save a few seconds. But there's another collectible. Sonic tokens. You have to collect all of these coins in a single map to reveal a secret character. The only difference is you can fall back to third place and still complete the task. Ask. But now, you have to race the character one-on-one -on -one to unlock them. Speaking of characters, let's look at the complete roster of racers in Sonic R. You start with four to pick from. Sonic, Tails, Knuckles, and Amy. For some reason, Amy is the only character with a car. You might think this would make her control differently than all the other racers, and you'd be right. Amy can't jump, and although that shouldn't matter for a racing game, it really does matter here. Dr. Robotnik gets added to the roster after you beat the game driving his little hovering jalopy. He plays just like Amy, automatically hovers over water and cannot jump, but he doesn't get a speed boost. Instead, he fires a lock-on attack at foes. Now, Amy's speed boost, that recharges over time by itself. Dr. Robotnik's homing attack, though, it costs 10 rings each time you use it. That might sound good to you, but if you pick either of these racers, there will be whole sections of the map that you won't have access to. For example, there are these springs that bounce you to elevated areas, but you have to jump on them to use them. And remember, Amy and Robotnik can't jump. Then there's this section where to continue on your path, you have to hippity hop across. Jumping characters can do it. The non-jumpers though, they fall to their doom. Some jump and some don't. Some hover and some won't. Some have attacks and others can't. It's all over the place. Then the rest of the secret characters all behave in some mix of the previously established abilities. The funniest looking is Tails Doll, since it looks like he's unanimated and is just floating through the stages without any fear or regard for personal safety. But the ultimate character, the one you get from collecting all the Chaos Emeralds, the one that really establishes just how unbalanced the races can be, Super Sonic. He's real quick to accelerate and has a top speed way above anyone else. And unlike regular Sonic, he floats above all the water obstacles in every level and seems to jump higher as well. Nobody can catch up to him. Truly an ass.
Cat. The existence of a character who's so overpowered compared to the rest just completely and thoroughly breaks the game. The racers, the levels, the controls, the power-ups. Nothing in this game seems to work right. Sega clearly needed some direction on how to make a character-based racer. Maybe they should have looked to Nintendo for clues. Oh, can we gush about Mario Kart 64? Yeah, I think we need to. Mario, Mario Kart 64, 64 is, is fantastic. fantastic. Everything that Sonic R falls behind on was done almost to perfection by this game and even Super Mario Kart from 1992. Mario Kart 64's racing mechanics work and are fun to play. The levels? Amazing. Mario Kart 64 was chock full of racing goodness, with four championships, each including four different maps for a total of 16 unique races. It's a good thing this far more impressive game came out after Sonic R. Otherwise, it would sure be embarrassing, wouldn't it? <laughs> a year? Sonic R came out a freaking year after Mario Kart 64? They had time to learn from this super successful fan-pleasing game and we got this? How did this happen? Sure, it looks bad at first, but don't forget, Mario Kart 64 wasn't attempting 3D models for their racers. Sonic R was doing something way more advanced, something that the Nintendo 64 simply couldn't do. Uh, only Diddy Kong Racing did, and it hit the N64 a few weeks before Sonic R came out, a kart racing game that had more levels, various vehicles, hub worlds, and multiple event types, all done with fully 3D models for every single racer and their riders. Rides. They did all that for Diddy Kong? Diddy? He was a secondary mascot. Yep, Sonic R had to compete with Diddy Kong and Diddy won. Banana slamming sadness. It was too late for Sonic Team to learn anything from Diddy Kong Racing. That came out way too close to the release of Sonic R. But Mario Kart 64, that's fair game. And the differences between the two experiences are insane. Mario Kart 64 is a more dynamic and exciting game to play. Sonic R, on the other hand, is an open loop with a finish line staple to it. The levels feel sloppy and can confused in their intended flow. And the only tension you feel is when you're desperately trying to regain control of Sonic while he's spin rolling. If you needed further proof of Sonic R's overall failure, two player races in this game are unplayable. Draw distance? Nope. It's reduced even more than in single player. But the real friendship killer? Who gets to pick Super Sonic? This is one of those characters that you and your friend would fight over because deep down you know that selecting him is like clicking an instant win button. Mario Kart 64's multiplayer, by comparison, is infinitely better. You can play all the tracks with up to four players. Oh, and battle mode? It's king! Hunting down your friends, trying to pop their balloons, was the most fun way to spend a late night. Oh, right! The battle mode! So that's 16 racing maps plus four battle arenas. That's like 20 stages of gameplay that can be played in multiplayer. It's a buffet of fun! Sonic R is more like a stale Kit Kat bar that fell behind some shelves. It tried to mimic Mario Kart's battle mode, but we don't think they really understood what it was. There's a mode called Balloon, and you run around the existing maps looking for balloons. I mean, what the hell is this? It's like they went to the game's director and asked, how can we make this game better? Balloon. The player who collects five balloons first wins, but neither of you are winners. Because you're hunting for five balloons in a Sonic game! Sonic R feels so insultingly small, but despite that, they found it appropriate to wholesale borrow a level design for their end level, Radiant Emerald. I mean, look at it. Look at it! This is Rainbow Road. Are we wrong? Even the lyrics to the music for the level mention Rainbow Road. Was that on purpose? Did they do that as a wink and a nod to Nintendo? What does it all mean? I think you might not be surprised to learn that the Sega Saturn was discontinued a year after this game came out. They ended up porting Sonic R to PC. But Sonic R did have one more turn around the track in the Sonic Gems collection. Sonic Gems version of this game is a port of the PC release, which featured differences from the Saturn. The draw distance is farther, frame rate higher, and there was bonus weather effects. It can rain? And it can snow. And when it snows, it causes all the water hazards to freeze over. Exciting. If you simply must play Sonic R, Sonic Gems is the way to go. But don't for a second think that the game redeems itself, because at its core, it's still Sonic R. The worst part of this game's legacy is its relationship to Mario Kart 64, coming out a year later and seemingly learning nothing from its existence. Except... 
Balloon! Maybe they weren't trying to make a Mario Kart clone, instead trying to blend the racing and platforming genres. But that experiment pretty much failed and resulted in a disastrous final product. The next Sonic games we got from Sega were better, but we had tasted bitterness, and we secretly knew that it could easily go back to that dark place once more. And oh boy, were we not prepared when it did. Some say that Sonic R was rushed and simply needed more time, but folks, during the same console generation, Nintendo published two owned mascot-focused racing games. Sega should have been capable of supporting their developers well enough to make at least one good kart racing game. But regardless, many believe that Sega Saturn was always doomed going up against Nintendo and Sony. It feels like Sonic R was just one of the last indicators of Sega's failure with the platform. For us, the console, the gameplay, and the desperately poor use of Sonic gives us no choice but to exclaim, It's just bad. Super Sonic Racing, everybody race onto the clouds. <laughs>